8th edition is really starting to kick into full gear with the next set of codexes coming out for all the races of Warhammer 40,000. And with that, we've gotten a fresh look at some of the races we've come to know and love. Uh, Blood Angels, for example. <laughs> Oh, man, that was a good codex. But uh, with those older armies uh, comes some new ones as well. And the Adeptus Custodes have finally received their first full-fledged non-Forge World, non-White white Dwarf codex. And this is a majestic time as they are some of the coolest uh, regal and enigmatic figures in the early and current Imperium. And in the earlier days of the hobby, they were mentioned purely in the fluff or in these... Uh, beautiful illustrations of, of space marines decked out in heavily engraved power armor with these red plumes and top helmets and such. They also had these glorious spears. But uh, they they were known as the Emperor's Guardians, a Legio Custodes. Uh, today, though, we're going to cover their early history in the Unification Wars all the way up to present day. And just as a heads up, if, if you're reading any of the Horus Heresy books, I might spoil some things from Betrayer, uh, Master of Ma Mankind, and, and other books. So if you're up to date, you'll be fine. But I wanted to forewarn you all. But without further ado, and I'm not even French, let's get into the Adeptus Custodes. We've talked about the Primarchs of many of the Legions, uh, or Adeptus Astartes, or Legionis or Adeptus Astartes, and we've gone in about their gene seeds, their home worlds, etc. And things are very different, if not distantly similar, for the Adeptus Custodes. Uh, the Custodians of the Emperor are the consummate Praetorians, the Golden Brotherhood that always flank, protect, guard, and execute for their immortal Emperor. And over nine feet tall, just like a standard space marine, uh, these Golden Giants are almost regarded as myth more than fact. If we're to think of the history of all things space marines, they're even further back in the timeline than the uh, proto-space marines, the Thunder Warriors. And this does not by any means make them obsolete. And he here's why, and this is kind of an important thing we haven't really touched much on. Technology in Warhammer 40,000 is in a rampant decline, uh, which is weird because you have all these sci-fi spaceships, space marines, and uh, the, Philip the future of uh, Philips Hue and uh, Lumen Globes. But this is a truly low point. The Mechanicum does whatever they can to recover this of their recover technology, uh, namely standard template constructs, or STCs as they're called, uh, from before Old Night during what is called the Dark Age of Technology. That's when all these STCs came about. Now that sounds ominous, right? Like it's a bad thing? It's not. <laughs> the Dark Age of Technology was humanity's absolute height, where they were, they uh, knew the most and were at the bottom. Like they knew the most, they were the most technologically advanced, their, their empire expanded far and wide, and now we're at the bottom of the barrel. So this lends credence to the fact that the Custodes would be even more advanced than their Space Marine cousins. So we can go into the Thunder Warriors in another video if you guys want, but I'll, I'll get back on track here. So these are the, the very first of the Emperor's foray into genetically and engineered super soldiers, and the perfect weapon for the Emperor's will. And they're so far advanced that only a Primarch can really match their martial skill. In, 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 in Betrayer, in Betrayer um, we have some of the other Marines actually I think it's word bearers, actually dueling with the custodians. And they talk about how they are straining against all of their might to try and get one hit on these guys. And they're acting like they're they're training, the, I mean the custodians are acting like they're training neophytes. So they're leaps and bounds above the rest. Unless you're possessed by a demon, but that's a uh, cheating, an apostasy. So take that, heretic. Uh, but one thing I do want to note is that the, the word bearers actually mentioned that the... Custodians don't fight as a unit or as uh, uh, one's squad or unified uh, Porsche or army. They fight individually. They fight as singular warriors. They don't fight as a whole. So that's something that they kind of point out and say, like, look at them. They're, they're extremely efficient killing machines, but they're singular killing machines at that. But to go further into those uh, differences, we should go into the induction process. Uh, just like the Space Marines, the Custodians go through a similar process of augmentation, alchemical application, and various other procedures to make, quote-unquote, them superhuman. And they're chosen from a pool of candidates and then planted with the gene seed and blood of the Emperor himself, the purest of all forms of augmentation. And the success rate is heroically low. Heroically! Uh, the Space Marines look at a wide range of success when initiates transition into becoming Space Marines. Uh, their bodies generally accept the gene seed. Maybe one in several tens or maybe 100 accept it. 
Uh, in the case of the Custodes, it's far lower. Maybe one in several or hundred thousand. I'm sorry, one or several thousand. Uh, by this example, though, you, you have a, a fighting force that could never work on that level that the legions could during the Great Crusade. Even at its absolute height, the Custodians only numbered like 10,000. So it, it earns them the title, The 10,000, which is hauntingly unoriginal. But we have this echoed in Master of Mankind, where the Custodians or, or other personnel are constantly referring to the greater collective of Legionis Custodes as the 10,000. Even most of what we know is shrouded in a good deal of myth and hearsay. There, there's this one titanic battle in the early days of the Great Crusade. And uh, one thing to note, a lot of the bigger battles were against orcs that had spread to consume entire systems. In fact, we know that during the Ulanor Crusade, the Imperium was fighting against a massive orc empire. This being the crusade that the Emperor then eventually, you know, quits the Great Crusade and says, I'm out of here, guys. Take care of it from here, boys. I digress. Uh, it is said that no more than 1,000 custodians have been seen in one place at any one time. And during the Battle of uh, Giros Thravian, that's exactly what happens. You have Horus, you have Rogel Dorn, you have Mortarion. And they're beset on all sides with this massive green tide. It's, it's Horus's trademark move. Go for the head of the snake with a three-pronged attack. Uh, attack with the center being the strongest. And uh, they kind of have this moniker that's always go down the center. It's a sentiment that's echoed across Horus's legion. And in this... They fell into a trap <laughs> and were slowly being overwhelmed by this vast green skin army. And the Emperor teleports to the top of a Gargan, think uh, an orc titan, uh, to kill their leader, Garkul. In doing so, though, he, he broke the back of the mighty orc Wa. And, and as his custodians slaughtered over 100,000 orcs with only three dying. Wow. Uh, each one's name, though, was written upon the Emperor's armor uh, by his own hand. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of tradition that carries over to the Grey Knights, this venerating of the honorable dead in a, in a chapter, quote-unquote, if it could be called that, of a, an elite few. There's a lot of that kind of early-day hyperbole that goes on here, too, like, 100,000 orcs fell before the custodians, with only three dying. And I, yeah, it's sure, it's probably like... It's probably as expanded as it is with the Battle of Thermopylae, with 300 Spartans squaring off against millions of... Uh, Persians, when it was actually probably a smaller number, but you deal with it as you as it goes. It, it kind of adds to the the space opera fluff of it all. But now that we have a baseline established of who the custodians are, let's go deeper into their origins uh, around the time of the unification wars. And it would probably make a lot of sense to start with the big question: What are the unification wars? Uh, well, throughout the Age of Strife, the subsequent end of the Dark Age of Technology. So, just to kind of Put this into a timeline here real quick for you. Dark Age of Technology. Old Knight happens. That's the Age of Strife. Right before um, the Age of the Crusade. Which is a whole different thing in and of itself. But all of Terra is pretty much cut off from their empire amongst the stars that we talked about. Was created during the Dark Age of Technology. And this happens around the 25th millennium. 25th, 6th or 7th, one around there. And results in a ton of infighting and the rise of techno-barbarians. Sounds so sick, right? <laughs> uh, and there had to have been a nation that ruled all of humanity before, but no one really knows anything or uh, of that like kind of bygone era, or, or it was lost in the Age of Strife. So as humanity devolved into anarchy and infighting, a large amount of techno-barbarian states emerged in the mix. Um, I'm going to throw up a quick map here for you guys just to give you an idea of how many of these existed, but the lore on this alone is vast, very vast. You can tell from this map, it's huge. And it requires a video all to itself to do it proper justice. But this is just meant to give you a perspective. You know, the Emperor is coming back into a lawless humanity where he finally decides to step from the shadows and lead mankind. Uh, and that, that's an important note here too. Uh, we know from books like Master of Mankind or just the general history of the Emperor, he's been around for forever. He was a culmination of shamans that took their lives to basically help combat chaos down the road because they noticed that as people were, as proto psychers were dying, their souls were getting eaten by demons. So they said, hey, how about all of us in one grand ritual create a super being that can fight these? That, again, a whole other video, but he's been there since the very beginning. Like, day one, tadpole status, all the way to now, space marines. 
at this at his very first appearance though the lord of lightning huh metallica as the emperor was often known was uh, flanked by four giants in gold with red crests and that's the actual first mention of custodians in the lore and from there his legio custodians grows to not really a legion but 40 <laughs> or or so as they become the de facto generals and leaders of his army as well as his personal body bodyguard now keep in mind there isn't just the Emperor and the Custodians taking over the entirety of, of Terra here. There are those proto-space marines that we talked about, Thunder Warriors. And these warriors are the first vestiges of the Emperor's genetically enhanced army. Whereas the Custodians are his first like, hey, let me see what I can do with genetically enhancing things. But as the Emperor unified the entirety of Terra through either force or diplomacy, the Thunder Warriors started to get phased out with their true heirs, the Legionis uh, Astartes. Uh, the first legion, the Dark Angels, you know, uh, they became one of the foremost legions, earning a lot of glory in the Emperor's name as they helped in the Unification Wars. But there's a certain moral ambiguity when it comes to the Emperor's actions. Uh, definitely one of those for the greater good scenarios, and that's kind of what the, the Tao actually lived by, right? The early Tao Empire is all about for the greater good, it's all towards the, uh, the completion of the Empire. Kind of the same thing here with the Emperor, but kind of does whatever it takes for the betterment of humanity. So at the final battle of the Unification Wars, the Thunder Warriors were killed to a man in the event known as the Culling. Now, the, the greater populace understands this as, oh, it was a heroic titanic last battle and every single Thunder Warrior died for the might of the, em the Emperor and for humanity in the Imperium. Not the case. In the Culling, there's a com they're all killed by a combined might of the Legional Custodes and the Legionis, uh, I'm sorry, Legionis, uh, Stardis. So, both just wipe them out to the man. There's, there's a few stragglers here and there, but for the most part, the Emperor doesn't care to, to track them down. They're kind of, you know, uh, relics of an ancient age at this point. From this point on, though, Terra signs the Treaty of Mars with the Mechanicum of, of Mars, and the Imperium is born. The Great Crusade begins. Throughout this time, as the Ant Legions are reunited with their Primarchs, the Custodians fight alongside their Emperor. You know, exacting his wrath upon the foes of humanity as they grow with the borders of the fledgling empire. In the very beginning, the custodians were seen uh, where the emperor was. And you'll see how that is a big deal later on in the video. But without the primarchs, the emperor took to the field all of the time. It was pretty much emperor custodians and all the, the fledgling legions. And it wasn't until Horus was found and the rest of the primarchs after that, that the emperor was able to quit the battles before they were even fought. Which is great. Like he's like, oh, okay, Horus, this one's you, big guy. But by the time Olinor Crusade had completed, the Emperor and his custodians all returned to Terra. Now this is where the custodians' role in the history of the Imperium starts to kind of slide into either more of a clandestine role or at least a far grander role. Uh, gone are the times of this massive golden host alongside the Master of Mankind. That sounds great. But during and even right before the Horus Heresy, the Emperor dispatches pairs of his custodians to watch over any stirrings within the legions and ensure that the uh, uh, great crusade as it were stays true to the emperor's vision uh, for a secular empire and that's important because there were some uh, murmurings about of the warrior lodges or, or even venerating the, the emperor to the point of godhood and it was important that the emperor kept a secular empire that did not believe in things like that they believed in logic science and math because if they did it would empower the nascent chaos powers or ruinous powers more or less and it's kind of a, a foggy line on how that really works but you have to remember that these guys might even rival a primarch's command of the elements of the imperium not I'm not talking about the strength i'm talking about their actual ability to uh, requisition any army fleet or, or equipment that they need at any given time there's no instance of them outright commandeering a primarch's command uh, unless it was at the order of the emperors of course or anything of the sort but there's nothing in the lore that hints that they would not be able to short of the physical confrontation that would arise um the custodians were all powerful in a lot of ways obviously they're not going to win physically against a, uh, a son of the emperor but still like i said there's nothing in the, in the book that tells them well they can't really walk up to horus and say hey no dad says stop but once the horus heresy broke into full effect the ten thousand spent their time aiding the emperor in his silent war with the webway they were joined primarily by the uh, Sisters of Silence in combating all the demonic hordes that looked for entry into Terra. You know, remember Terra was 
broken open now by, uh, not Mortarian, but Magnus the Red coming in there. So the demon is like, oh, we're coming in for some snacks. The Emperor, seated upon his golden throne, he has to basically nonstop combat the demons from the Immaterium, while his custodians reap physical vengeance. So it's basically a, a bit of a two-pronged attack. While the Emperor is holding them at bay on a, on a uh, metaphysical level, the custodians are exacting that vengeance, like I was saying, on a physical realm. Uh, this might be a good time to go into a bit about the general demeanor and attitude of the custodians, because uh, I feel like we've talked a little bit about everything except for them. They're not the same. They're not the same as the Space Marines. But if we're looking at just the Space Marines, it's worth mentioning that the Space Marines are relatively cold or removed from the normal constraints of human behavior, like fear, remorse, uh, uh, sorrow. Most of what would depress, quote unquote, someone are swept away in the Space Marine psyche. And a lot of the books remark that they even seem ineffectual to certain circumstances. And I mean, I personally, I don't see that. I see them as above a certain level. Um, I feel like they purposely elevate themselves to be above a certain level. They, they kind of say, oh, you're a human. You have human concerns. I'm a space marine. I think thusly. But they only really find companionship in their brothers slash cousins from other legions. And they live and die by their honor, which colors a lot of their emotional intelligence, I think. I mean, there's there's a lot of things you can say about this. Like originally, I have a kind of a, a, a crocked up theory that it's like you basically take these teenagers and you implant them with the, uh, the abilities of, of supernatural superhumans. But super you make them superhumans, and they still have the mental and emotional intelligence and well-being of a teenager. It is uh, yeah, great. Your first space marines are going to be like that after a hundred years sure they'll kind of shrink out of that but i would imagine the initial space marines have some emotional growth it doesn't say anything about oh we injected them with the the protozoa gland that makes it so it enhances their uh, emotional intelligence like there's nothing that talks about that it gives them eidetic memory it gives them multiple stomachs multiple hearts lungs that can process toxins but nothing is said about the emotional well-being of a space marine and that's not supposed to be like a like a let's go hug them but it's supposed to be like a Okay, you don't just take a teenager and he's not a, a massive like a war killing machine with only a circular or a singular mindset. He's going to have to grow into that. Now, custodians, on the other hand, sorry for that digression, uh, are as cold as they come. And it's not to say that they're unfeeling, but it's to say that they never that they have near no outward display of emotion, and they regard most emotional interaction as just insipid. Uh, there's this part in Master of Mankind where this child comes across a custodian. It's actually one of the main custodians and another space marine, a blood angel. And it's this kind of brilliant display of how different the two are from just an emotional level. The emperor himself is somewhat calculated as well. So this kind of plays suit as why this happens, but with his mind is always kind of on the bigger picture at all times. The panderings of a child, the least of his worries. So this is reflected in his guardians. The space marine who is a, again, a blood angel, actually has to step in and comfort the child because the custodian is so incapable of basic human sympathy. Like the child asked him a lot of like deep and engaging questions like, hey, are you the emperor? He's like, no, Just blank, like not nah, that, that ain't me. And he kind of pretty much is very curt and he's very crass with the child, but doesn't understand that, that that's something that you're not supposed to do to a kid because the kid doesn't know better. And this really has to do with the fact that the custodians go through such a rigorous process to become custodians um, as the emperor crafts them almost perfectly in his image. And you have this singular fighting force that is not meant for the wide sweeping planetary wars that the Legionis Astartes fights. Instead, you have an elite paramilitary whose sole purpose is the defense of the emperor and their uh, eidetic memories jam packed with every bit of warfare, assassination, and every other means of killing a, a head of state. It's just all crammed in there so they can defend against any kind of attack. Uh, in single combat, they're monsters, you know, always reaping huge tallies before falling, if at all. So the difference is quite palpable as you read more and more and more about these guys. But as the Horus heresy drew to a close, the 10,000s numbers started to dwindle. When the Emperor made his final gambit and teleported aboard Horus' battle barge, only a handful of the custodians were able to actually accompany their liege. Unfortunately though, the Emperor was dealt a mortal wound by Horus and interred upon the Golden Throne. This brought immeasurable shame to the custodians as they swapped their red cloaks for black cloaks in both mourning and humiliation. And as Rubuk Gieman uh, resurrected the Imperium, or Bobby G, uh, he removed the ability for any one individual 
to wield the same power that Horus did. He, he rewrote the Legionis Custodes. So no longer were they the force they once were during the Great Crusade. He renamed them the Adeptus Custodes. This fighting force was relegated to protecting the Emperor of Mankind and the Imperial Palace alone. That's it. Nowhere else. And there were only personnel, there were the only personnel allowed within the Sanctum Imperialis, which is the Imperial Throne Room, uh, where the Golden Throne resides. Now, although they were ashamed, they were not beaten or broken here. Uh, they still fought viciously for the Emperor, mounting multiple clandestine wars against usurpers, assassins, or, or fledgling plans for anarchy. Uh, even as the Emperor lay in a constant declining state, the custodians did their job, you know. They uh, ensured that his vision stayed true. In, in whatever kind of small scope that they could do that. And something I didn't bring up is the level of connection that the custodians had slash have with the Emperor. Rather than having full-on conversations in the palace room, uh, they would typically relive memories in their own minds with the Emperor there to talk about the semblance of the memory on the discussion they were having. It's, it's, it's all very sweeping and dramatic, but also very telling of this relationship. Uh, even the custodians can't really piece together how the Emperor ticks when it comes to any form of these interactions, but they remain stoic nonetheless. You know, they're always kind of listening to the lesson or maybe even questioning or asking questions to the Emperor, and it all just kind of seems very uh, Aristotelian as far as it's like, oh, you'll, you'll understand in time. And my theory is that even though the Emperor is comatose, relatively, uh, he is still very much psychically active, and he imparts either visions or the same means of communication to his attending custodians. In the 34th millennium, uh, I mean, he gets the custodians to aid in the removing of a future tyrant that is trying to take the position of the High Lord of Terra by getting the custodians to bring the head of the Sisters of Silence to the throne room. So that tells me that he can he can make some sort of uh, connection to them. You know, he jolts that the head of the Sisters of Silence with a bit of head magic, and then bam, they go and off the tyrants. So he's definitely still there, if only reduced in physical power, if not actual psychic power. Now, in the 42nd millennium, we see a resurgent Adeptus Custodes. Uh, during the creation of the Codex Astartes, uh, all of the Space Marine legions were limited to the chapters of 1,000 large Space Marines. Uh, the Adeptus Custodes still functioned at its full strength of 10,000 Custodians. Uh, with the resurrection of the Primarch Rob Bobby G, uh, the resolve, and I'm, I'm sorry guys, I say Bobby G because pronouncing his name every time, pains me because I'm so bad at it. But the resolve of the custodians was essentially restored. You know, they cast off their black co cloaks, uh, they took to the stars once more, and, and almost a full fighting force. 300 of their number stay behind. The, the companions of the emperors are called. The rest join Gimen in a new crusade amongst the stars. The best defense is the best offense, it's being an, an axiom that brought about the, the action to defeat the enemies of the master of mankind, you know. That's what they kind of uh, prescribed to. They said, well, we can sit here all day waiting for them to come or we can go bring it to their doorstep. And just with, just as with the uh, Grey Knights chapter, each time one of the custodians falls, the bell of lost souls rings out on Terra, kind of commemorating their death. And uh, remember, this is, or this was at, at one time the most deadly and feared of all fighting forces in all of the Imperium. Since the Crusade, they were, for all intents and purposes, purely mythological. Now you have this elite force lashing out in the enemy once more, and they, they brought their panoply, or panoply uh, with them. Uh, access to the, the best that the Imperium has to offer gives them plenty of perks, uh, utilizing technology that would otherwise be uh, uh, barred to normal Marines. Uh, Contemptor Dreadnoughts, uh, utilizing teleportation devices that can be teleported directly into the heart of an enemy or these uh, massive golden tanks, or these huge golden flyers skimming the battlefield. Uh, it's just this insane sight as King Tut's space marines destroy everything in sight. It's like watching an episode of Pimp My Ride with space marines being the people that they're pimping out. So we've, we've I can't believe I made that parallel. Uh, we've touched on their history, but how is this chapter, for lack of a better word, organized? And these are effectively ageless marines, not like their Astartes counterparts that have been around for sometimes thousands of years, say they are immensely old and wise, but by no means weak or frail in that age. Uh, the Captain General is the leading head of the entirety of the Adeptus Custodes. 
Oftentimes, he uh, holds a position amongst the High Lords of Terra. As part of the Imperial Senate, though, he does have quite the deal of uh, political clout, as it were. Then you've got the, uh, the Captain General is then joined by a uh, council of around 10 other custodians, and they're called the Custodian Tribunate. And they are in charge of organizing the defenses and logistics of the Imperial Palace, as well as the services of the entirety of the custodians to the Emperor whenever they are called upon. Clearly, that's not very often right now, but in the past. In the past, okay, guys? But below the Tribunate is the Prefectorate and the Shield Captains. And you can look at these titles given to the individuals that lead or orchestrate field commands of detachments slash armies and, and as such with the Prefectorate being the uh, the veteran of the two. So the Shield Captain being the, the junior. And beyond that, you have all custodians really acting as as peers. And the rank's in place more as a, as a means of communication and decorum than actual supremacy. Uh, the following titles, kind of the ones I'm about to just jump into here, extend to more they're given setup for war than actual ranks. So let's just jump into those. The Hykenatoi, uh, the most standard kind of run-of-the-mill custodians that we're used to. You know, uh, We see these in the power armor. Uh, it's actually artificier armor type of uh, soldier. The custodian guard, the sentinel guard, the guys with the spears and shields, as well as the uh, hetarian guard. Then there's also the uh, Thranatoi. And these are your heavy shock troops and thus uh, are kind of mounted in tactical dreadnought armor, known, you know, as another badass name, uh, Terminator armor. And I think actually in the new 8th edition, they have a new name. And because uh, that's one big thing here that a lot of this lore might actually shift a little bit uh, when the 8th edition book drops. Uh, I think this is, so this is the 25th, so it will be dropping on the 26th. But the new name for these uh, uh, Thronator are actually Alaris Custodians. And those are the ones that are in Terminator ar armor. And the uh, the Sagittarium Guard is, is uh, leads the charge in their hulking suits. That's the name of the uh, of these uh, um, these these uh, Terminator armored custodians. And they're they're nigh impregnable as they have this adrathic weapons, which are these amazingly awesome disintegration beams. So way different than even normal marine weapons. And then another you know, delineation or, or, or rank, I guess you could say, is uh, the Cataphractoi. And they're a bit different of a uh, twist here as we move away from the standard kind of infantry style uh, custodians into the ve vehicles. So the Cataphractoi are the pilots of the, for the custodians. They're mounted on the interceptors and other gunships as well as grav bikes, uh, jet bikes, tanks, transports, you know, all manner of vehicles. Uh, to better bring swift justice to the Emperor's enemies. And you've got the uh, the Foroi, and this is the clandestine arm of the Adeptus Custodes. And we said that they're always trying to find any weakness in the Imperial Palace, right? Or, or discover any kind of means of assassinating the Emperor that they have not thought of. Well, the Foroi are charged with that task, essentially. They, they're sent out from Terra, and they try to create plots to assassinate the Emperor so that the other custodians can help to guard against it, kind of constantly staying ahead of the curve as far as uh, protecting the Emperor goes. And this sect of the custodians is so kind of like secretive and clandestine that it's hard to even tell where the uh, Officio Assassinorum, which is basically uh, all of your, your multiple uh, assassin houses, uh, starts and the Ephori ends, which is really the intended effect here, I'm sure. But uh, our last, again, delineation here is the Moratori. And they're probably the smallest division of the Adeptus Astartes, and they're the uh, honored dead who walk. The Moratori are the uh, revenant defenders of the Emperors, the, the contemptor dreadnoughts that house the remains of a near-dead custodian that fell in battle. So still, very few custodians have fallen, and even then, less by means in which they could be uh, interred within an Achilles pattern. Uh, or, I'm sorry, it's actually a... Achilles or Achilles pattern. I was, I was right the first time. Uh, pattern contemptor dreadnought. Uh, there are, are some like 100 or so of these guys, but they're these ancient warriors defending the halls of the Imperial Palace. Phew! Covered a lot in this video, and I'm not gonna lie, it, it was pretty dense for what is usually a pretty light series of 40k videos. But I think it's important to talk about the Custodes. Not just because they're about to get their new codex and the 8th edition rules, but because we're gonna start to 
run into them a lot more in our talks with the other Primarchs. And with that, I didn't want them to be these ominous gold guardians with spears in the background like the Imperial Guards in Star Wars. <laughs> but hopefully you guys got a good idea or at least a general sense for the Adeptus Custodes. Uh, if you want me to go into further detail about, say, the Unification Wars, the Techno-Barbarian States, or even the Thunder War Warriors, l let me know. Uh, the early Imperium is really a mess of lore, so I didn't want to dive into that tangent without a thorough amount of time put aside. Uh, but, as always, thanks so much for watching here today, guys. If you are excited about the Adeptus Custodes, or if there's any bit of the lore I left out or glossed over that you really enjoy, please just feel free to comment on uh, below and let me know. Uh, smash that like button like it's a heretic and don't forget to subscribe. Um, with Again, with some of this stuff changing here tomorrow, the whole entire lore might shift a little bit as we come quote unquote up to date with what's going on in the Adeptus Custodes timeline. But have a good one guys and take care.